fork in the road and decided that what we needed more in our life was clothing, houses, the perfect mate, the perfect job, all of those things, instead of just deepening our relationship in God. Where did we go, where did we shift that? To what, when we look at our lives, what is so important that we need so much? And think of the energy that we spend on all of that stuff versus the energy we spend on deepening our relationship in the love, beauty, holy mystery, spirit, universal intelligence, God. All the energy that we put into the stuff because we think we need it. We need it. What we need in our lives for that wholeness, and as we look today at the fourth step, which is our spiritual action step of the four steps that we have embraced this month, as for those of you that are new on this day or the last couple weeks, we have combined the powerful steps of AA along with 12 spiritual principles of the universe along with the 12 promises of AA and the 12 action states. And by putting them together, we've created a wonderful plan, a wonderful format, a wonderful guide, a wonderful map, a wonderful instrument to create transformation or shift, which is what our, our theme is for the year, to be a vessel for transformation. And so this week we're looking at, we will heal the differences with our higher power. And so I guess the question to ask, is the question before the question is to heal our differences with our higher power, we first have to believe that we actually have a higher power. Not theorize about it, because it's kind of like, well, how do I develop a relationship with something that I'm not sure is there? Because what my cognitive, meaning in your head, concept of God is, is a higher power are a little greater than my father, my dad, the person that raised me. Or some supreme being that is, again, aware of every one of our behaviors and movements and thoughts. And if we don't do well while we're here moving, behaving, and the thoughts, they're going to be held against us, and we're not going to evolve into that eternal thing called heaven that we've been told about in the Christian teachings. And so we're looking at today, if that's what our concept has been, then how can we have a deep relationship with something that is holding resentment against us if we've lived out of integrity in our lives? Anybody in here ever been out of integrity a time or two? Okay. Many? Yeah. More than three times, raise your hand. More than ten Bless you, you're my kind of person. <laughs> so we're looking at that, healing, the high, healing our relationship with that higher power. And so it's understanding that the first step is believing without a shadow of a doubt, or at least being willing to believe without a shadow of a doubt, that there really is something in this universe that is greater than you or I. And yet we're a part of that thing that is greater than us. And it's that energy that is causing us to be us. And so healing that energy, healing our relationship, that's why I wanted to look at the title of Took My Higher Power to the Picture Show. Because if I was to ask you this question, and I've posed it before in other sermons, if spirit, God, holy mystery, love, beauty, energy source, is your next door neighbor right now, would I be assuming a lot that you haven't had it over to your house recently for breakfast, lunch, dinner? Or you need to do a lot of preparation before it come in because your house is a little neat, messy. So we want to look at today, if you were to actually go to the show, to a picture show, with your higher power, where would you sit with it? Would you sit If we looked at the current situation where you are right at the moment, I guess I could have used that chair right there. <laughs> Power of positive thinking. I think somebody come in and step, sit there. Would you sit about like this? 
about this far apart. And as soon as the movie started, you'd forget it was there. Because isn't that what we've done once life has started? We've forgotten it's over there. And we've become focused on the stuff. This outer life. Relationships, family, doing things, accomplishing things, educating ourselves, raising kids, all those sort of things. We focused a lot out here, but we forgot about this because we're in life. We're in life. We don't need that. We're doing all right. Most of the time. So where would we be in that relationship with our higher self if we went to the picture show? Or would we feel like at times that we just went to the picture show by ourselves? This is the way we go through life, by ourselves. I'm all right. How many of you ever taken yourself to the picture show, sat by yourself and sat in the last row? And you got so fresh with yourself. <laughs> you remember that one? Wrapped your arms around your waist, got so fresh you had to slap your face. So we are continuously looking at what does it take till we get to the point where we can sit right next. Be with our higher power. See, we are continuously rediscovering who we are. We were created from source energy, and that energy is love. We are that energy. We are love incarnated. What we call spiritual growth is really a desire, a need to remember who it is that we are. As we clear away from ourselves the pain and resentments from wounds of the past. That is such a powerful statement there. And that is one of the biggest keys to our spiritual journey is clearing away from ourselves the pain and resentments. And the more clear we are and more healed we are, the more separate and, and distance we've been able to put ourselves between ourselves and our pain and resentments from the wounds of the past, we are able to see more clearly that we are energy of creation. We are energy of creation made physical. Isn't that awesome? That if we took the energy outside of us, if we took it out of this container, that in a sense it would be, and I know this isn't trying to be negative about the metaphor of what's going on outside, over there at, at the nuclear power plant in Japan, but in a sense that's what we've done is we have put six feet of cement and steel oftentimes around our spirit. And we've enclosed and enwrapped ourselves. Now, instead of it being radiation that would leak out, how about if we started to break down those walls, it would actually be love that would start to leak out. Wouldn't it be great that we would be worried about uh, contaminating the world with unlimited love? <laughs> and we could so easy. How many of us, though, hang on to our love like this? And we do slap ourselves sometimes because we hang on to it so tight. If I asked you in the last week, how many times have you said the word, I love you, to somebody? Are you saving them? <laughs> do you think you need a reserve? Do you think you need some extra in your bank account for the day when you will have somebody to really say I love you a lot to? Are you afraid to say I love you because they might not say it back to you in return? You want to know how you start healing your separation in our higher spirit from our higher power? Is you start loving. See, love isn't a thought, it's an action. It's not something that we think about doing, it's something that we do. If you want to know how close you are to your higher power, ask yourself how loving have you been to those around you in this last week? If you have people at the end of 168 hours of being around you saying, man, back off, you're too loving. <laughs> awesome. You probably need to back off from them a little bit because they can't take it. Because it's probably been a while since they last loved themselves. So where are we with our love? See, because the great thing is, when we're around those that are loving also, we then respond to each other from a place of connection 
and understanding. See, it's hard to feel connected to somebody that isn't returning love and goodness and joy and happiness. Have you ever tried to be connected to somebody like that that's like this? It's hard. Just trade places with me. Did you get it? I'm only teasing. When we become aware of our connection to others, we grow in our empathetic ability. Empathy. One of the greatest acts of carrying out God's pure love through us is when we can move into that place of being empathetic. And you know what empathy is? It's being able to imagine, to be able to put ourselves, to visualize, to sense, to have a feeling of what it's like to be in somebody else's shoes. As the old saying that's been around so long, what it's like to walk a mile or a day in another person's shoes. And to understand that maybe our thoughts, maybe our actions, maybe our behaviors, when we're not living from our higher authentic self, can have an impact on them. Because when we start to become aware of how we can impact others, then we can shift into that place of being empathetic and go, wow, I didn't realize that what I was saying or doing was having that type of impact on you. I need to look within myself. Am I being out of integrity? Am I being out of alignment? Am I not expressing my higher self, but I'm instead expressing my lower self? And I'm unaware that those, those thoughts, those behaviors, those actions is impacting you. That's a state of empathy. In other words, what we want to be aware of is what is it like to be in relationship with you? Are you the type of person that you would really like to be in relationship with? Are you easy to get along with? Are you fun? Or do you have so many darn peculiar behaviors that it's hard to imagine anybody being able to be patient with all those? You're so picky, you're so finicky. Every little thing's just gotta be just perfect and then you might be okay at the end of the day, maybe. But yet you think you're easy to get along with. No problem. How many of us criticize a lot, or we judge, or we're, we're, we're continuously being cantankerous? And we think, wow, we're easy to get along with. No, maybe not. <laughs> That's that part of being empathetic. Because you see, the more, I don't know why that was funny. <laughs> it's, it's funny, the things that I think are to be funny, you don't, and the things that I don't think, I have a clue why they're funny, they are, so that works out. I think. <laughs> Oh, I don't know what I'm going to be like when I'm 70. <laughs> I'll talk to you, you'll talk to me about that. So the group consciousness of being with people who remember who they are, there are times that we forget our overall purpose and our goals in life. We stray from the path of integrity. And if I ask you, and if you were to, to do a, a, a 180 in your life and look back on your life, when you've strayed from your path of integrity, how many people in your life have you had that were great models and mentors on how to get back onto your path of integrity? How many? Or were you left always trying to figure it out by yourself? You know, a lot of times how, how we were told to get back on the path of integrity is at the end of a belt or at the end of somebody's um, verbal um, assessment of our behavior. And that wasn't always joyful. We were threatened that you better behave right. I'm not talking about that kind of model, but I'm talking about, you know, when we're off, you know, whether it's in off in a relationship or we're off, you know, in how we're thinking and feeling about ourselves or our actions and the behaviors out here in the world. Maybe we're not being as honest as we could or as truthful as we could, those kind of things. When we've been off that path, who is it that you've had to mentor to model on how to get back onto that path of integrity? I asked the other day in the class that we're teaching, Healing the Inner Child, um, the 30-week class that we're entering into our 20th week, I put out to the class last week or the week before, I said, in your life, how many people did you have modeled to you self-love? Not tell you what it was, not, and I'm not talking about they made sure their needs were met. I'm talking about a person that had a healthy spiritual psyche. That they knew how to love God, they knew how to love themselves and take care of their own needs. And they knew how to love those around them. How many did we have model that to us? If you had more than three, you're lucky, feel blessed. 
Because most of us may have a hard time modeling or naming more than one, if at all. And I'm not talking about somebody dead, somebody gone. I'm talking about in your current, in your life, in your lifetime. How many people in your life model to you healthy self-esteem, self-love? Because when that doesn't happen, then we're left kind of trying to figure it out on our own. And then we get a whole hodgepodge of stuff kind of all rumbling in there of how to do it. And what usually ends up is we get caught up in our own pain and we find it difficult to move from there. Those around us who are like-minded and focused on the same goal of self-love can assist us in moving out of our pity party. You know that infamous party? How many of you continuously have to keep going to the store to get stamps for your pity party invitations? <laughs> I mean, it's like it's an endless supply. And when we feel sorry for ourselves, we are stuck in that victim consciousness of not believing we deserve anything better. And the reason we don't deserve anything better is because we have created a separation between ourselves on a spiritual level and from our higher power. And that is a place of powerlessness, and, and it separates us from the energy of love. So how many times have we spent staring at the negative balance in our bank statements? Feeling the weight of the financial pressures upon us. Feeling scared and angry and frustrated. We look at our relationship position in life and we find ourselves, that we find ourselves in. And we're hoping and praying for a miracle. Anybody been in that place? Come on, God. Just a few extra dollars, a few extra thousands, just the right mate. Come on. Come on. Come on. You're out there. If you're out there, show me. And we look at our relationship positions we find ourselves in, hoping for that miracle. That some amazing unseen force will somehow lift us from our current circumstances and miraculously change our lives forever. At least our partners. Have we taken that approach at all? That some amazing unseen force will somehow heap down good favor upon us and miraculously we'll have this dramatic shift. And when that dramatic shift happens and nothing changes, we find ourselves wondering, why me? What's wrong with me? Feelings of doubt and uncertainty enshroud us, as though a dark cloud has descended upon us, blackening our whole world. Time, as it always does, keeps ticking away. The burden of our troubles weigh heavier and heavier on our minds and our hearts, and we want to buckle under the intensity of our emotions. How often have we sat there wrapped in our own self-pity? Anybody have that blanket? I know I've, had, I've been there my time, myself more than once. And in those moments, I've had to pull myself together. If only for the sake of those around me, especially my family. And it's been in those darkest moments when I realize that there is something inside of us that is causing me to keep breathing. That is causing my cellular structure to stay together, even though it feels as if it completely wants to come apart. Have you had moments where it just feels like your whole insides want to just explode? But something keeps it together. Something keeps you breathing. Something keeps your life full energy circulating through you. Something keeps your mind working. It is at these moments that I feel the closest to that friend at the picture show. It is then and there that we begin healing our relationship with our higher power. When we make a conscious decision to view those moments in the moment, right here and right now, not as a problem but as a challenge each of us knows we can face and overcome. Challenges, after all, we have done this many a time. How many times have you made it through times that when you were going through them, you thought, there's no way I can make it through it? And then somehow the days keep, the hours keep rolling by, the days keep going by, and before long, and that before long could be a month, it could be six months, it could be longer, you're on the other side looking back, how did I ever do it? 
but yet you did it. What do you think it is that kept you moving? That's that higher power. We have all done this many a time. In fact, each of us, if we were to look back, we would see that each and every challenge or problem that we've experienced in the past is now simply a memory. In this way, you were practicing the third step of AA without ever knowing it. You were surrendering your past to the Spirit, turning your will over to your higher power, our own egotistical, unhealthy will. And the intensity of the feelings that we felt at those moments in time have now diminished. They have become a part of who we are and a part of our life story. I know too that today's challenges of whatever any of us are going through at the moment will one day be our distant memories. And we'll be able to look back on and in recognizing so we'll sense a, pow a sense of power returning to us. Understanding that first and foremost we can still choose to be happy right here, right now, with our higher power. And it will not stop us every time we turn within and say, I love you, God. I love you, Spirit. I love you, higher power, so very much. Never will there come a time where it says, nope, that's enough. You don't need to love that energy that has created you anymore. You've done it. You're good. It's always there welcoming us. But sometimes we need a step to get back to that process. And for those that may have grown up in the traditional form of church, like the Catholic Church, it could be if it's been a time that you have wandered away from church, that how you're gonna get back is you're gonna go to the confession. Anybody ever been in that confession? So sometimes that's where we start. Not one person in here. There, one, oh, we got three, four, very good. So this guy that hadn't been in a confession for a while, he goes back to the confession box after years of being away from the church. And he pulls aside the curtains and he enters and sits himself down. And he looks around. And he sees a fully equipped bar with crystal glasses. <laughs> the best vestry wine, Guinness on tap. <laughs> Cigars and liqueur chocolates nearby, and on the walls, a fine photographic display of rather bosom ladies <laughs> who happen to appear to have mislaid their garments somewhere. And he hears the priest come in. Father, forgive me, for it's been a very long time since I've been to confession, and I must admit that the confessional box is much more inviting than it used to be. At this, the, the priest replies, get out, you idiot, you're on my side. <laughs> man, when I first read that, I thought, man, we really missed something, a new thought. <laughs> I was sent this story called Clay Balls, and it goes like this. A man was exploring caves by the seashore, and in one of the caves he found a canvas bag with a bunch of hardened clay balls. It was like somebody had rolled clay balls and left them out in the sun to bake. They didn't look like much, but they intrigued the man. So he took the bag out of the cave with him. As he strolled along the beach, he would throw the clay balls one at a time out into the ocean as far as he could. He thought little about it until he dropped one of the clay balls and it cracked open on a rock. Inside was a beautiful, precious stone. Excited, the man started breaking open the remaining clay balls. Each contained a similar treasure. He found thousands of dollars worth of jewels in the 20 or so clay balls that he had left. Then it struck him. He had been on the beach a long time. He had thrown maybe 50 or 60 of those clay balls with their hidden treasure into the ocean waves. Instead of thousands of dollars in treasure, he could have taken home tens of thousands of dollars. But he had just thrown it away. It's like that with people. We look at someone, maybe even ourselves, and we see the external clay vessel and it doesn't look like much from the outside. It isn't always beautiful or sparkling, so we discount it. 
We see that person as less important than someone more beautiful or stylish or well-known or wealthy. But we have not taken the time to find the treasure hidden inside the person. There is a treasure inside of each one of us. If we take the time to get to know that person, and if we ask God to show us that person and the way God sees them, then the clay begins to peel away and the brilliant gem begins to shine forth. May we not come to the end of our lives and find out that we have thrown away a fortune in friendships because the gems were hidden in bits of clay. May we see in the people in our world as God sees them. How many clay balls have we tossed away in our lives because we couldn't see the hidden treasure inside of them? How many? Because it didn't look like it should, or as we imagined it should be. Because things haven't been just the way, or this person hasn't been just the way that we think they are, so we need to just toss them aside. Because there can't be the divinity of the universe hidden away inside of their magnificent presence. Because we're so locked up into our own shallowness that all we can see is the external part of a beingness instead of the divinity that is hidden within each one of us. That divinity isn't hidden. It's waiting to come out and it comes out when we're loving. It comes out when we're empathetic. It comes out when we're accepting. It comes out when we're doing selfless service. It comes out in so many ways when we're holding a child, when we're there caring for our grandparent or our parent as they're experiencing their last few days here on earth. It comes out in so many ways. That's the hidden beauty that we're all about revealing more and more each day. We don't need to hide it away to build these barriers of cements around ourselves and keep a distance from our higher power and separate from. We need to embrace and accept the divinity that is within us because the more that we accept the divinity and heal that separation and that imagined distance between us, we heal the separation between ourselves and each other. And the more that we heal the distance between ourselves and each other, the more that we can create a global community of one heart, of one love, of one peace, of one joy. We are a vessel for transformation. So I'm asking you on this day, is this the day that you can turn hate into peace? Is this the day that you can turn resentment into love? Is this the day that you can take your sadness and turn it into happiness? Is this the day that you can take your separation and turn it into oneness? If we're a vessel for transformation, we can't keep doing the exact same thing over and over, day after day, week after week, and expect a change. Inside of us is housed this magnificent divine essence. And it's waiting to pour out in words of kindness, in actions of joy, in actions, not in intentions that we talked about last week. Intentions are cheap. Everybody has them. It's the actions that speak louder than our words. You heard me bitch and moan about being here. But look where I am. You know why? Because there's something inside of you, whether you're here for the first time or you've been here since we sat down as a team to vision for this church on July 23rd of 08. You've been able, inside of my clay, and inside of my pieces of clay, you've been able to see something inside of me, sometimes better than I can see myself. And I can't tell you how much I honor that and how loved I feel in this group and how much I want to continue to serve, to continue to grow our community here that we can focus on being more loving, more peaceful, more compassionate, more empathetic, more providing selfless service as we grow not only here in our community uh, of our center but outside the walls. We want to focus on these principles and I'm asking you to deepen your commitment on this day to healing that essence that is within you in any form of separation. Because when you go to the movie theater, I want there to be one seat. And it's you and your higher power. And you don't walk around separate from or believing it. You go to the movie and you only buy one ticket. We are one. Let us pray.